So we'll get started now. So uh, I just want to say thank you to everybody for joining Zero to Hero on our first webinar. Um, and thank you to Anna Pittman and Claire Orange for joining us as our expert panelists today. Um, there's definitely been a lot of interest uh, in the topic of motivation at the moment. I think uh, none of us were prepared uh, for what was about to come and we're all struggling without having our daily routine um, and with having restrictions and limitations on our behaviours and, and our creature comforts, I suppose. Um, so we're all struggling to kind of find the motivation or, or um, yeah, I suppose the, the get up and go that we would normally experience at this point in the year. Um, so I'll quickly introduce our panellists. So we have uh, Claire Orange. You want to give us a, a little wave, Claire? Um, so Claire is uh, an author, a mother of four boys, a parent educator, a speaker, the Channel 9 parenting expert, and uh, also a trainer. Um, and we have Anna Pittman. Uh, so Anna is an international facilitator, a coach. Uh, she specialises in people optimization and alignment. Um, she's worked in organisational development for the past decade and consulted with a wide range of industries. There's a lot, um, but they include mining, oil, gas, uh, finance, and also hospitality. Uh, so thank you to these lovely ladies. They've both worked with Zero to Hero on, um, different, in, in different ways or contributed in different ways over the past few years. Um, and I thought they'd both be perfect at, at um, addressing the topic of isolation motivation. Um, so I'll first uh, get each of you to just introduce yourself if there's anything I missed um, and I suppose why uh, you were happy to join us on this particular topic today. <laughs> Shall I start? Yes, yeah. start Anna. All righty. So I've been working with Zero to Hero as a volunteer mentor and speaker for the last three and a bit years probably now. And outside of that, I run a positive psychology business. So we work with organisations to help them create a healthier, happier workplace. Uh, so that's kind of the core business of what uh, what we do and my background specifically in health, wellbeing and psychology. Right, and I'm Claire. I've also had lots of wonderful interaction with Zero to Hero as, you know, WA sort of premier youth mental health charity. Uh, so I'm always very proud to be asked to speak like today. Um, so I am a mum of four, so I've got uh, boys on the journey towards being men. I don't know when the man thing happens. Doesn't seem to be soon. Um, <laughs> um, and I'm a therapist. I work in child and adolescent mental health. I run two businesses um, outside of this. And um, well, I think we're about to talk about uh, how COVID has, has hit those businesses. So generally, I'm pretty busy right now. Not so much. <laughs> Beautiful. Well, thank you for uh, being here. Um, so, yeah, we will start with that question. So I'll, I'll pose it to both of you. Um, we'll start with Anna, as Claire just spoke. How's COVID affected you and your family, your business, et cetera? Yeah, so some words of wisdom. If you're thinking about starting a speaking business right now, don't do it. <laughs> uh, no one wants facilitators right now in case they give them COVID. So our main, uh, what I do with most of my time is flying within WA around Australia and globally, in fact, delivering face-to-face -face programs with about 20 people in the room, as well as doing one-on-one -on -one coaching. So that COVID's completely turned that on its head. Uh, initially, we were still flying and then obviously in the last couple of weeks, um, we're completely grounded. So we've seen probably about a 50% hit to our profits so far. Um, probably expecting that to get worse over the the coming weeks, um, and yeah, it's 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 a, a probably a tricky time. Um, reframe around that though is that there's a million things when you run a small business that you never have time to get to. So using this downtime um, as a way to build online platforms and um, get some more articles together and things like that. So doing my best to to make the most of it. Um, from a personal point of view, I'm actually due to have my first baby in June, so uh, a little COVID baby. Um, I read an article the other day that said that they will be a generation of true wisdom. So let's uh, hope for that. So yeah, COVID um, from a personal point of view has completely turned all my birth prep on its head. And um, my partner's actually a doctor. He works in at Fiona Stanley. So he's been busy preparing for what we hope is not a uh, viral bomb. Yeah. Right. And uh, yes, well, COVID has definitely slammed into both of my businesses. So like 
like Anna, I, I speak at conferences, I train teachers and parents, I work in classrooms. Um, so, of course, all of that uh, has come to an end and pretty much for the rest of uh, 2020 at this point in time. But I suppose, you know, one of the things that I really hang my hat on in my business is that I'm a serial entrepreneur to begin with. I love the thrill of the chase. Um, and I'm also highly resilient and that's a lifetime of chain, uh, training really. So I guess, you know, this really puts me into MacGyver mode and most of you will be far too young to know even who MacGyver is, but he'd get like a, you know, a toothpick and a, um, a dead fly and a piece of rope and he'd turn it into an escalator for a hundred people to get them out of burning building. Um, so I'm really hoping to get my MacGyver on and uh, there's a word that they use in small business and in the startup world that I'm engaged in and uh, it's called pivoting which is being highly adaptable and flexible uh, and, and really you know bringing those skills to the forefront. So I guess I'm pivoting as best I can in my business and um, in terms of my family, my eldest has lost his job, uh, which has been pretty tragic. My second son's uni has kind of been put on hold uh, while they figure out uh, how they continue with university-based uh, education, especially prax. And I have two younger ones still in school who are now homeschooling, um, one of them being a year 12. And I would say for any of you in those upper years of high school, this is certainly uh, far more challenging for you than it is for anyone else, really, who, who can work around their timetable year 12s. Yeah, this is a time of grieving for you. There's a, there's a lot to lose and a lot to change. So, so that's what's going on in my family and businesses. Yeah, okay, thank you. So what, I mean, what are the different states or headspaces that people would be going through right now? Um, I mean, it kind of feels like that's all we're talking about now, COVID, unprecedented isolation, all of that fun stuff. Um, what's going through our heads? How's our heads processing this right now? Yeah, so from my point of view, the way that I explain it is just grief. Like we're going through the grief cycle. Um, we are grieving life as we know it. We're grieving our freedom. We're grieving our regular routine. Um, never before in most of our lives, I can't speak for everyone listening in today, but this will, you would have never experienced a time of such unprecedented change and uncertainty and the brain hates both of those things. And so it's really okay to be sad and to kind of grieve that stuff um, for a while. I think the balance though is finding <clears throat> the balance between let ourselves experience that negative emotion, but then not letting it cripple us so we can't achieve anything over these next six months. Um, lots of opportunity here if we know how to harness our emotions in helpful ways. So hopefully today is helpful from that point of view. And I, you know, I would say in terms of headspace for this, it's really very much like being on a roller coaster. If you've ever had the misfortune, I'm not a roller coaster girl. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, if you manage to do that, you've prepared yourself uh, for getting through this. It's it's quite tumultuous, the, the ups and downs. And I'd say, you know, for, for our, our young people still at school, you're worrying about your grades, you're missing your friends, you're missing your daily routine. Maybe there's, you know, a little bit of joy about not having to get up uh, at that time to catch the bus and wear that daggy uniform and uh, some of those private school hats, honestly. They, they just need a big revise, don't they? <laughs> so, uh, if you're not having to wear your pinafore and your hat, you're probably quite happy. I'm happy for you. Um, but I think, you know, all of this stuff that's going on, that feeling of being a bit overwhelmed and, and being a bit overjoyed about stuff um, comes at us hard and fast. It can be quite rapid fire and uh, it can happen simultaneously. So I think having that chaotic headspace this is what we'd call quite normal um, at this point in time. But as Anna said, you know, if it becomes overwhelming uh, to the point of becoming crippling, then it's not a good thing. But if, I think we're all feeling a little bit uh, shaken uh, in the head at the moment and trying to find which way is up, and that's perfectly normal. Yeah, beautiful. Um, and I just want to say hello to uh, Bev, who, so we thought that we were going to get a lot of young people, a lot of our camp alumni, et cetera, on this webinar. Um, however, Bev's just introduced herself. So she's a parenting coordinator for Anglicare in the Goldfield. So it's really great that through this medium, we've never done anything like this before. And it's really great that we're able to um, reach places like the Goldfield. So please, if you are watching this webinar, feel free to uh, introduce yourself like Bev has done. Um, so we can get an idea of who's on the call um, or who's on the webinar so we can uh, target our responses uh, to who is on the call. So, so far we've got 69 participants and we'd love to hear where you're all 
coming from, ages, etc. So that the next questions we ask um, can be targeted towards you and, and your own situation. Um, so Claire, I will ask you, um, our brains, that lovely little uh, organ that uh, dominates our life and, and uh, governs what we do, what's happening to that right now? Oh, a lot uh, is really the simplest answer to that question, uh, really a lot. And I think, you know, Anna really hit the nail on the head when she said that our brains really don't like uncertainty and change. It's, it's some of the things that brains just don't work with well in the human psyche. Um, our brains really love to automate within a routine. So, you know, I often use talking about making a cup of tea on autopilot. You know, you can go flick it on, flick through your social media screen. You can make a cup of tea, you know, just how long to leave your tea bag in, how much milk, you don't even have to look. It's all autopilot. And our brains like that. They love to create this sort of sense of routine and, and, and just this little groove that they go down. And right now, um, we've kind of been flicked out of the happy groove where we're just trundling along in our lives and into the, you know, the whole world's against me. It's a bit like when you discover all of a sudden you've got to put your milk in and your brother just drank all of it um, out the bottle and you've kind of got the goosey end bits. Uh, it's a bit like that. It's that feeling of being a bit disgruntled and brains, brains don't really like that. But, you know, in this sort of situation when we're talking about brains and, and, and really our mental health, um, understanding the brain function, but the good and the bad of it is pretty important too. So um, all of us are kind of, we, we're a slave to something called our limbic system and it's, uh, it comes up from your brain stem here. It pokes into every lobe of your brain. So it almost looks like my hand and it pokes into your brain. Um, and it, it really is kind of your basic survival mechanism. It's the first bit of the human brain that has activity uh, in babies. So even Anna's little baby on the inside now, that's the, the, the limbic system is, is still be, is being quite well exercised. So it's, it's a pleasure seeking. It's about sleep and, and survival. And um, it's kind of, it really governs our emotional life. Um, so right now, our little, our little um, limbic systems have kind of gone into red alert uh, in our brains because we've got this perceived threat. So we're not in the happy grief of just making the cup of tea automatically. We've been hoisted out and we're into a much more emotional part of our lives. And it does take up a lot of headspace being in your limbic system. If you've ever been stressed critically about something like about being bullied or not having enough to eat or um, having an assignment that was true, that sense of, of impending doom, uh, that's kind of your limbic system helping you to, to channel your action uh, mostly in a positive way, but sometimes it can go into overwhelm. So when, when our brains are like they are at the moment, really there's the big four stress responses that we talk about, and maybe you're experiencing one or some of these. So um, the, the, it's fight. Um, so feeling a bit irritable and on edge, that's, that's one of your Fs, These that they're all Fs, uh, not the one that you're thinking. So there's fight, there's flight, which makes you kind of want to run away and hide in your little duvet um, fort in your bed and pretend it's not all going on. Uh, there's freeze, where you just feel immobile, like you just can't do anything, it's all too much and you just kind of, you know, sit and count your, count your pencils on your desk. And the other one is fawn, is where we really need other people to make us feel healthy, where we're, we're out, we're reaching, but in this environment, of course, that's a little bit restrained. So those are our big four stress responses um, in our brain. And I think that, you know, once we get into those sorts of red alert systems in our brain, we start to do things differently. We start to look for threat maybe where it's not. And this is quite typical in the human brain. So you might find yourself obsessively watching the world -a meter counter on um, coronavirus, how many people are infected and how many people have survived and how many people are critical. You know, that's your limbic system going, we're, we're under attack. Let's go out and, and, and seek information to keep us in this heightened state, to keep us safe. Um, and it's, it's kind of not useful, especially if you let yourself stay in that state for a long period of time. Well, we've got to make sure that we're working with our brains to, to kind of calm them down because your brain impacts your body. So you might feel tense in your muscles and you might feel your heart racing and your thoughts spinning. 
well, actually, that's all about survival. We need tense muscles if we're going to jump out of the way of the bus. Uh, if you're all loose and floppy and relaxed, you know, the bus is going to hit you and keep going. So all these things like the racing heart and the, the tense muscles, they're all about keeping us safe and, and in that survival mode. But if we stay there too long, we get a very big buildup of what's called cortisol, the stress hormone in the brain. And a little bit of that's all right, it's called normal, but a lot of it can, can really change the way you think. So Anna's going to cover some of these brain chemicals um, in a little bit more uh, detail for you. And I think they're important. I like to remember the acronym DOSE. So um, dopamine is one of your brain chemicals. That's your focus and attention chemical. We need a lot of that. Oxytocin is your relax chemical and your love hormone. Um, you've got S, which is your serotonin. So serotonin is your happy chemical. Um, and sometimes when your limbic system is in overload, those sorts of chemicals don't come into play. So it's hard to relax, hard to concentrate, hard to feel connected, hard to feel happy. And then your E is your endorphins. And we get that um, as, a, as a kind of a feel good, that's the, the hormone that runs through you. But I know Anna's going to cover them in more detail. So basically, limbic system is on. We've got to try not to keep it on for too long. We've got to get into that rational, relaxed thinking as well. And we'll talk about how you do that and how that impacts your motivation too. Awesome. So I've seen a few um, memes and things going around all over social media of uh, the Hunger Games and tributes and things like that. So it is a little bit normal right now to feel like we're all in the Hunger Games or some variation yep. of that in reality. Yep. Well, we're seeing it, aren't we? I mean, we're, we're out there, we're duelling for toilet paper. Um, <laughs> when, when you see humans behaving in survival ways, it means that anxiety is high. You look at that and I know people have been quite um, negative about it. But actually what we're looking at is quite normal, anxious human behaviour when they feel like they have to survive. Not sure why it's tied to toilet paper, but anyway, um, <laughs> it's also tied to baked beans. That's good. Let the toilet paper go. Uh, <laughs> beautiful. Um, so Anna, we did just say that you would talk about the brain and, um, and all of the, you know, the hormones that we should be experiencing or what's going on. So do you want to elaborate on that? Where does, where does this motivation actually come from? Why are we not feeling it right now? Yeah, so motivation ultimately comes from one of the neurotransmitters or brain chemicals that Claire was just talking about um, being dopamine. So dopamine is the, the hormone that's actually released by our brain when there's a reward within reach. Uh, and this is really important because sometimes we confuse dopamine with being our pleasure hormone, but rather it's the hormone that encourages us to move towards things that make us feel good. Um, and the interesting thing about our brain is that the reason why we've got such a primitive fight or flight response is because the brain's still really quite primitive. So they I think the last upgrade that the brains had was about 45,000 years ago and that was the, the prefrontal cortex or the conscious brain and that's the part of the brain that separates us from all of the other uh, mammals. Um, and then the, the, the part of the brain that Claire was just talking about, the, the, the amygdala or the limbic brain, they, they think that, that that part of the brain is actually about 100,000 years old, hence why we behave so primitively when we're under stress. Um, but Ultimately, um, we think, our brain thinks it's still operating in fairly simple times back basically when we're living in caves. And in a really simple way of explaining it, your brain is designed for survival and it's designed to move towards things that make it feel good and away from things that make it feel bad. In a nutshell, that's what it's designed to do. Um, so how, did, how does dopamine actually work? So I'd like you to just imagine um, our ancestor uh, 40,000 years ago um, sees a juicy mango up a mango tree and decides to climb up to grab it. Now, just as that mango is within reach and the, the, our ancestor was reaching for that mango, dopamine is actually released by the brain to encourage a little bit of motivation to actually get it. Our ancestor then gets a mango, eats the mango, um, no more dopamine anymore. You don't necessarily get that, that feeling anymore, um, but we like, we're pleasure-seeking humans, so then therefore the cave person goes down the tree and looks for something else that's going to make it feel good. Now, back living in cave days, everything that made us feel good was good for us. So food helped us to survive, relaxing helped us to survive, all of these things made us feel good. But in 2020, we've actually invented a whole bunch of things that make us feel good but it's not actually good for us. Like sugar, alcohol, uh, social media, gambling, gaming, all of these things make us feel good, but they're not actually good for us. Uh, and the key difference between those things and the mango up the mango tree is back in cave people days, 
the rewards were scarce, whereas now the rewards are always available. And this is actually what leads to really quite addictive related behaviours because we can constantly actually, we're constantly seeking these, these dopamine rushes. So to give you, I suppose, a modern day example, um, you're scrolling through Instagram after probably two hours of scrolling and scrolling and scrolling and scrolling. And every single time your brain attends to a funny meme about the coronavirus, and don't get me wrong, they're there and they're hilarious, and you laugh, your brain literally gives you a rush of, of your happy hormones, of your endorphins, making you feel good. And you actually start to convince yourself that Instagram is actually really good for me. So I develop a neural pathway in my brain that goes, you should do this more often. You should do this more often. You should do this more often, which is why couple that with what Claire was talking about with that fight or flight response in our brain, some of us right now are just achieving nothing. So in this particular webinar, we'll talk to some of the strategies around how we can actually harness dopamine in more constructive ways. Yeah, beautiful. And so, um, so Claire, why are we actually finding it so hard right now to stay on track or to be motivated or why is it so easy right now to procrastinate? Yeah, absolutely. Good questions. Well, I think, you know, a long time ago in, in psychology, we used to talk about the seven plus or minus two rule. You know, that, that was your optimal functioning as a human being. That's what your mind could hold, that, you know, your capacity to manage um, incoming information sensations from the internal world it's not it's not finite it's not infinite you know it's it is finite it is little there's just this much that we've got to work with um, so we function optim optimally when there's enough stimulation if we don't have enough stimulation we get lethargic and and we kind of can't be bothered and if we have too much stimulation we kind of shut down and we just feel in overwhelm because the brain is just taking in too much and that limbic system gets primed to say I've just I've had enough and I'm dialing out so I think right now all of us on on planet earth are coping with a lot you know there's a lot of information about the virus out there and there's a lot of misinformation about the virus I think you know Anna was saying right at the beginning the only thing she listens to or reads is anything that comes out of the government and comes out of who the World Health Organization because otherwise it's just this um, assault. So there's lots of information about job losses and what people are doing and school closures and um, how, you know, your routines and expectations are changing. And I think you can get to the point where you feel like you're in overwhelm. And in my home, we've got seven of us living in one house. We're living in each other's pockets. We're here all the time. Um, and, and while that's kind of lovely, um, uh, that was in case my children are watching. I'm loving it. Um, it's actually kind of stressful. Like now I'm just hiding out in my bedroom and I feel like I've got babies again where you have to go and hide in a toilet to eat your chocolate. Um, so, you know, there's, there's a lot, there's a lot on and that can kind of really dent your motivation to get things done. And also you have to be very um, internally motivated because there's no one standing over you. There's no teacher saying, if you don't hand that in by Friday, you know, we're going to half your mark by 50%. So there's a lot of requirement to, to drive this stuff internally. So I think, you know, the procrastination out of that comes out of, there's a saying that's um, analysis paralysis. You know, when you give yourself, to, if, you, if you've decided that you're going to go and buy a new bike and you go like, I'm going to go Gumtree and I'm going to look at all the bike shops and I'm going to see what's on eBay. By the time you finish, you have so much information, you don't buy a bike at all. Um, and I think it's like this. I think there's so much coming in that, that the brain can kind of just go into shutdown. And when we feel those big four stress responses, you know, the cortisol rises and the limbic system is doing its, its normally very important job, um, it can kind of put us into this feeling that we're in, we're in absolute overwhelm. And then you can start doing things. So procrastination is usually not non-activity, it's ridiculous activity. So instead of doing your house assignment, you'll go, if I, if I organised all my post-it notes in colour and size order, um, it'll make my house assignments so much better. And the end of today, that's all you've done. House assignments still not done. So procrastination is kind of trying to get the things done that make you feel a bit better without doing the important stuff. Um, and and it's almost like a self-help thing. You're, you're, you're trying to reduce the overwhelm, but also do a little bit towards activity, but it's not useful stuff. So that stress hormone that I've talked about a couple of times 
um, it, it's uh, cortisol, so um, above our adrenal, above our kidneys, we have little adrenal glands. They shoot adrenaline into the system when they hit the bloodstream and they head up towards the brain. We call it cortisol, which is our stress hormone. And stress hormone is, it just peaks and troughs like this over the day, very normally and very naturally. So sometimes if we feel a little bit of cortisol building up, it'll give us enough stress to get something done. And that's a good motivator. So I get stressed on my, my assignments due on Friday and that's enough. But when it becomes too much, I start to get into procrastination and on the other side, it's not very good. So this is a normal peak and trough in a day. It's very normal. We all go through it. When we're under duress like we are at the moment, we're stuck in our homes, we're without our social contacts, we're having to do this live stream, me from my bedroom, Ash from a furniture shop. I don't know, she just broke in. She didn't really. I just made that up. Um, you know, I am this... a furniture shop, <laughs> but my sister works here as an interior designer. <laughs> she, she didn't break in. I, I, behind me, so I didn't have just a white wall as well. The, the things we have to do to survive during COVID. Telling That's it. <laughs> but <laughs> so, you know, we, we're all out there doing life quite differently right now. And and that, that cortisol can become quite overwhelming. But there are things that we can do to send it packing that will raise your motivation. Anna will talk to this a little bit more. But things like um, exercise, uh, meditation, if, if that's something you do. Um, not everyone loves a bit of meditation, but um, you can get it through um, lots of routine exercise, lots of repetitive exercise. Listen to your flavor, favorite playlist, go and chat with a friend. That's stuff that helps the cortisol to flatten in your system as well. Um, so exercise, exercise, we think about having to take a run around the block. Well, actually, there's simple exercise and there's complex exercise. And all of it primes your, your brain hormones. So things like chewing gum, your, lots of your dopamine is actually made in the lining of your gut and it's moved up to your head on a protein. So things like chewing, lots of people will chew anxiety true and a lot of that is to get your dopamine pump going so you can get some rational thought going so if you're sitting there and you're really stuck for motivation you know crack out your chewing gum try not to go for the tim tams um especially when you're 48 i find they're not very useful um <laughs> but if you're younger you can probably do it you can probably eat them all but uh, things like chewing gum it's repetitive it's pretty good it'll get your dopamine pump in your in your gut going push it up to your head eat lots of protein so protein shakes nuts cheese oats that's what moves your protein up to your brain uh, your dopamine up to your brain it links onto proteins and it hits your brain so you can actually hack your system a little bit to produce a little bit more dopamine and to reduce your cortisol um, and of course those endorphins are pretty cool as well so um, something that gives you a feeling a sense of euphoria a sense of having achieved something that's that's pretty good as well to increase your motivation most likely go back and and do it again yeah beautiful so Anna, I mean, Claire has touched on this a little bit, um, but how do we trick our system? Um, so I mean, there's a lot of people right now, uh, the youngest person on our webinar at the moment, I think was 16. And then the oldest was, do we have a 58 year old? Um, so we've got people from all over Australia, actually. We've got someone, uh, Justin, JC from Sydney. Um, sorry, we've got Karen, 57. Um, so we've got a wide range of uh, attendees right now or, or people that are, are tuning into this. What are some surefire ways that we can hack our body, like Claire was saying, or we can boost those motivation levels um, for any age? Yeah, for sure. I think it can be incredibly powerful to understand what's actually happening at a neuroscience level in your brain, because when you understand that, you can take more control over it. Um, and the really cool thing about the majority of our emotions, which are dictated by the hormones, the happy hormones, the stress hormones that Claire's been doing a great job of explaining, is that they're actually triggered by thought. So the thinking being the first part of that process. So consider it thought, um, I feel a certain way and then I respond in a certain way. Um, your brain continually is going through this loop and every time you repeat a behaviour, you're more or less forming habits. And we're actually constantly forming habitual ways of thinking. And it's really important right now to be mindful of the thoughts that are actually going through your head because those thoughts are what tr is triggering these kind of stress hormones and things like that so that's making us feel um, so uneasy and therefore not being able to get anything done. 
So the strategy that we can use to trick our brain to feeling more motivated is something called reframing. So I just want you to think for a moment, what are some of the constant running thoughts that are going through your brain as you think about kind of COVID? You might be thinking, I'm, I'm bored, I'm, I'm so over being stuck at home, you know, I miss my friends, potentially I've lost income, I've lost my job, I've lost my freedom, um, you know, I'm worried about my loved ones who might be kind of vulnerable or older or have um, immune problems and things like that. Now, if you're, if you're thinking all those things, don't get me wrong, incredibly valid for you to be thinking that stuff, but also really quite unhelpful. Because if you think about the hormones that are released by all of those thoughts, it's more of those negative um, related hormones that Claire was talking about before. So you end up feeling frustrated and overwhelmed and bored as a result. So the trick is to be really conscious of what's actually going on in my brain. So as that thought comes up, rather than letting that thought and run with it, change the thought up. So rather than thinking I'm stuck at home, maybe you could change one word and say, well, I'm actually safe at home. I'm not stuck at home, but I'm actually safe at home. Um, rather than wondering, you know, how long is this going to go on for? You know, are we going to be stuck in this way for six months? You could ask yourself a question, um, how can I make the most of this particular opportunity at the moment? Um, rather than thinking... I've, I've, can I pause you just there? Because I think what you're talking about is really, really important. I want to give um, our attendees an opportunity just to write maybe what is the repetitive thought that they're having at the moment yeah. about COVID? Um, and then before you move into reframing and some examples of doing that, um, we can have them reframe it. So if you guys just want to type in the in the chat section, what is a constant thought or repetitive thought or concern that you're having? Um, you don't have to be too vulnerable. If you don't want to, you can write it on a piece of paper if you prefer. Um, but I'm loving the, the chat that's happening at the moment. Um, so, yeah, I think it would be really great if you guys could just share quickly what is your current frame um, uh, before we then move into how to reframe that in some, um, some positive ways. Can you guys, Anna and Claire, can you see the chat as well or would you like me to read, read some out to you? I think I can see it. Um, yeah. Last comment being yeah. um, from Sarah, the overwhelm of the length, year 12 is over. Is that yeah, we've got two year 12 students. My, my heart is, uh, is breaking for anyone in year 12 at the moment. Mm. Yeah, so they're scared um, that, the, that myself or a loved one will get COVID. Yeah, so there's some fear about that. Um, worried for loved ones. Um, overwhelm around the length of, of COVID. When's this going to be over? Yeah, and I think I, I was um, saying to, uh, you know, the Zero to Hero team today, if, if I knew when it would be over, I could prepare. But I think yeah. it's the uncertainty, you know, for if I knew the government came out and said, you know, by August 1st, life would resume, I could prepare for that and give myself tasks. And I think it's the not knowing how long uh, this will go for um, that's, that's hindering a lot of our decision-making and a lot of the, you know, the tasks and, and what we're putting in place. Um, so people are saying they don't know. Uh, if they'll get into uni, um, worried about not having work. So, yeah, there's a little bit of job loss um, and, you know, feeling the financial worries and burdens that come with that. Um, someone has lost their job, uh, concerns about work, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah, I just wanted to give uh, everyone that was tuning in an opportunity to, I suppose, understand what, what is the story you're telling yourself or the thoughts you're having before then Anna um, goes into how we can reframe that into a really positive life. I'm so yeah. sorry to interrupt you there. I just thought no, not at all. And, yeah, and, and I, um, yeah, and I just want to thank everyone for being so honest and vulnerable in, in the examples that they're giving. And, they're, and I do want to acknowledge that they're all legitimate thoughts. They're valid thoughts. Um, that's the reality right now. Um, but a really helpful con um, concept in psychology is a concept called locus of control. So we tend to operate from two different perspectives. We can either be internally locused or we can be externally locused. When we're being externally locused, we, we believe that we're not in control and we think that our external circumstances are driving the situation that I'm in right now. And I would argue for a lot of us, it is very easy to go into that headspace right now because there is so much outside influence that's actually influencing us in really negative ways. But the alternative way of looking at it is to be internally locused and to recognise that the only things in life that you ever have control over is my thinking, is my emotions and is what I do. What I do and say, my responses. This is all we have control over. So it's about two things. It's about acknowledging, well, what are the brutal facts right now? And the brutal facts are that there is a global pandemic 
impacting on every single person on this planet. And within Western Australia, within Australia, what does that mean for us? It means that a lot of us have lost our job, that we're at home, that we can't leave our home, that we've lost a sense of freedom. And there's a huge amount of uncertainty around what it means for my exams, for university, for my life in the next six, 12 months, even 18 months if our economy doesn't bounce back the way that we want it to. So it's, it's okay to experience those thoughts. But it's when we ruminate on those thoughts that we end up feeling completely suffocated and we can't do anything about them. So the first part of the exercise is acknowledging how you think and acknowledging those feelings, letting yourself grieve that stuff. And the second part of it is, well, how can I actually think about this in a slightly different way so I feel differently so therefore I can actually get stuff done? So all of the, the, the comments that are coming through that, you know, they're fantastic. Um, but I'd like you to think about what's a word that I can change in those statements right now that might change how I feel about it. So the example I gave you before, rather than saying I'm stuck at home, it's about saying I'm safe at home. Rather than going, when will this be over? It's about going, how can I make the most of the time that I have right now? So it's changing the words, maybe use an alternative question um, to think about it differently. Um, rather than thinking I've lost income, it's about focusing on the fact that this is an opportunity to be frugal. It's an opportunity to save the money that I do have because there is literally nothing to spend your money on because you can't go anywhere. So it's an opportunity for me to relook at my budget, to relook at my finances, to, to, to teach myself how to live frugally, which is a fantastic life skill that I think we could all benefit from. It's an opportunity to consume less which, you know, we're so obsessed with spending and buying and needing to look a certain way and have our nails done and our lashes done and our lips done and buy that outfit. But now you don't need to do any of that stuff because there's nowhere to go, right? So rather than focusing on what we don't have, it's about focusing on what we do have. Rather than thinking, I'm, I'm, I'm at home and I'm so bored, I'd like you to just think about the fact that you have a home. You know, this is a, a disease that has been spread predominantly by the wealthy who can afford to fly around the world. But the countries that are going to be most significantly impacted by this disease are not the wealthy. And if you live in somewhere like India right now and you are homeless and you do not have a home to isolate, if you do not have running water to wash your hands, if you do not have access to medical care, you will die from COVID. That is the brutal fact for them. So rather than thinking I'm bored at home, I'd like to encourage you to think, I am so fortunate to have a home. And it changes the way that we feel around the situation. And then we can start using those emotions in more helpful ways to carve out more helpful habits so we can actually make the most of the situation. Can I also just um, hop in there and add and say, you know, these are, these are unprecedented. I know that word just keeps coming up everywhere. Um, <laughs> It's exhausting, that word. If they say unprecedented or moving feast one more time. Why did you I your event? Yes. It'll just <laughs> pop off my shoulders. However, yep. I think it's fair to acknowledge that um, when, when we talk about stress, one of the most important things um, in periods of high stress is who stands beside you. So I know um, in counselling children, if a child goes through the grief of losing a parent or um, having to change schools and lose their friend, if we can find one key anchor person to put them with, we offset that stress. And it doesn't become what we call trauma, which is retained stress in the human being. And this situation means that actually, I saw someone say before, you know, how do I reframe my deteriorating mental health? Well, actually, you probably are under-resourced to do that for yourself right now. It is actually very hard curating positive thoughts when those brain chemicals like your serotonin and, and your dopamine, they're all out of whack. And that's where we need some really strong support. And, of course, Zero to Hero are fabulous at providing support. And, there's, and, and Ash will take you through what else is out there to support. But I absolutely know, for one, I'm, I'm here and I'm sure we can set, um, set up um, any sort of communication channel. If you're really struggling and you need a shoulder partner who's not a work accountability partner, but who's actually an emotional accountability partner, there are people who have got your back. You don't have to do this yourself. You don't have to curate those positive thoughts yourself. There's actually a whole bunch of very well-trained people who now have a lot of time on their hands. Um, <laughs> to take you on that journey. So please, you know, if you're out there and you're feeling desperate, please 
please do reach out and, and you know, um, Ash through Zero Tira will, will be able to provide you with resources and I, I am very happy to be one of those resources. You don't need to do this by yourself. You don't, you know, that it takes a lot of energy curating positive thoughts. It really does. Thoughts that drive you positively forward. Um, it's much easier to do it with someone who's right there to hold you up and, and give you strength in times where we're all gonna need that. So don't feel like it's a failing. If, you, if you're unable to do that, just make sure you've got the resources, positive, helpful resources to help you do that, who get you. Yeah, beautiful. And to the person that did ask, um, you know, how can we support um, or reframe, um, how can we reframe a deteriorating mental health during this, this component? I wouldn't suggest reframing that at all. And um, I'd love to chat to you after the webinar and make sure that you're well supported. And Claire's also put her, her hand up um, to support, support that person as well. Um, all right, so um, let's move in. So we've talked a little bit about um, procrastination, why it's happening, that it's completely normal. Um, we've also talked about some tricks or, or hacks around how we can um, trick our brain into feeling motivated again. Um, but first, you know, I'm always big on acknowledging what's so and accepting what's so. And so I thought it was really important uh, for our attendees to, to hear from you, Claire, or even if Anna wants to add to it at all, should we be forcing ourselves to get back into a routine? Um, or if not, um, when should we give ourselves that nudge? You know, what is the grace period of, of this? How long uh, should we allow ourselves to just be with what, what is and all of the challenges that, that we're facing right now? Right, um, and, and this is something that actually the three of us talked about a little bit before. Um, I would consider myself to be a very resilient person having got through um, a lot uh, in my lifetime. Um, and yet last week, uh, it was like I'd been squashed by a bulldozer um, and then a truck had gone over the top of that. Um, and that's not my natural state, I don't do that well. So I do think the grief that Anna was referencing at the begin with, beginning, grief requires space, that's what it needs. Grief is actually hard work and it requires energy. So I've noticed lots of comments on there and it breaks my heart, I've got a year 12 too. How do you positively reframe missing out on year 12? Well, I'm afraid there's not a lot that we can do in this situation. All I'd, all I'd encourage you to do is think about who are people in our not so distant past who gave up a lot for us to put us in this position that we can stay home and protect each other and take more of a global perspective. You are exactly the right generation to be taking a global perspective far more than anyone my age. You know what's happening out there in the world. Know that this too shall pass and that we will do the best we can for our year 12s to make this as extraordinary as we can under extraordinary circumstances. However, in terms of pushing yourself into your routine, one of my favourite things to say and my boys' least favourite things to hear, um, especially if I apply the mummy nagging tone, is the sooner you start, the sooner you finish. And it's true about this. Actually, we as humans automate things very quickly and I use the word habit. Uh, we love to habituate because it makes life easy, like making that cup of tea or riding your bike. You don't have to think about it. You just do it, right? It's just a series of steps. So if you allow yourself not to stay in the routine of being productive and taking some action steps every day, you will automate to that. It will get harder to get out of bed. It'll be harder to find your positive mindset. It'll be harder to do your reframe. So I would really encourage you is to allow yourself a period of time to grieve and to say this isn't fair because it's not. It's not fair for any of us. Not, it's not fair to have lost a whole year's worth of income. It's not fair to have a year 12 at home. It's not fair. That's, that's just the way it is, right? So we're not going to say it's fair and positive thinking will make it all fabulous. But actually, what it will do is when you, when you make that part of your daily practice, is it makes it better. And you can do it in lots of ways. And, and Anna's so right. It, it feels very simple, but it's not. Actually, your motivation does come from really working hard on your on your thinking patterns. So I would say if you've got yourself into a funk, you're sitting in your jammies and you're you're watching that count tick over and, and you, you're just feeling a bit sorry for yourself, get over it, do it now, right? Get out your jammies, get dressed. Even if you just get the top half of you dressed, no one will ever know what's on my bottom, bottom half. Could be nothing, could be my jammies, could have pants, 
none of you are going to know. Um, but I do make myself get dressed and do my hair. Um, and I learned that actually when I was pregnant with the boys, uh, not all at once, obviously, I had them one after the other like a rabbit. Um, but if you let yourself sit there in your jammies, then you just, it's hard to feel motivated in your pajamas. Your pajamas say to your brain, relax, don't worry about it. So I really would like you to think about getting up, getting into a routine. Think to yourself, you do six hours a day of school. You can nail this in four hours, max, right? Get in there, just get it done. Follow your timetable. Don't, don't make it too tricky for yourselves and don't, give yourself too much time to wallow in the misery of all of this. Really try and push yourself into a routine. And then if it doesn't work, uh, it doesn't matter because there's always tomorrow doing the same thing that we've done today, but at least have a really red hot go to get something done today. So I talk about one degree of change. If anyone's ever been counselled by me, you would have heard this. I'm a great one on one degree of change. That's all we need to make, right? To be going in a completely different direction to the one we're going in now. So what is your one degree of change? You don't need to be nailing everything on your to-do list. Do one thing, put in your house assignment, get it done. Um, and decide what you're going to do. Read one page of that ridiculous book that you've been given for lit. Um, answer one paragraph. That's your one degree of change. Uh, if you didn't go for a walk yesterday, go for a walk today. And you don't have to like bang out a 5K walk. You just have to do the block. Do it in your pyjamas. No one cares. Um, just do one thing differently today and make that promise to yourself that you will start to get this steady routine and momentum because... Once you get the little dopamine hit, your brain likes it. It'll do something else because it quite likes dopamine. Uh, if, if that becomes gaming or going fishing in the pantry or, you know, standing in front of the, the fridge like it could possibly be an ex-girlfriend, um, you know, go and choose something that's a bit, a bit healthier. Just, there we go. Someone said, I cleaned out one drawer. Cooking helps. Do a thing, one degree of change. Just do one thing a day. And that's more than plenty in these troubling times. I like Emily's response as well. So she's hacked uh, a school day. So she starts at 5 a.m. and therefore she's done school by lunchtime. She's got the rest Perfect. of the day. Which is, uh, is pretty cool. Uh, excellent. So um, if those on the webinar still aren't convinced that they should uh, put these steps in place or start to be motivated again, do you have any examples, both of you, uh, Anna and Claire, any examples of some famous um, isolation motivation or, or, you know, who's isolated and, and changed the world um, that might have those that are on the fence about staying in their pyjamas or brushing their hair the next day um, to get them over the fence is, is how can we, uh, yeah, how can we put this into place? Yeah, and, and look, there is, and I think we saw this with the, uh, the with the bushfires a couple of months ago, just people coming together and achieving really cool things in really hard times, um, despite, you know, some really significantly challenging situations. Um, and I think I saw a, a comment come up um, briefly before from one of the participants who said that there's a, they're following the, the kindness group on Facebook. I forget what it's called, but... Um, Adopt a healthcare worker. There's the Adopt a healthcare worker and... A few no, it's people. like examples of kindness during COVID and it's like a, it's got like 500,000 people in the Facebook group now. And it's just people sharing examples of like wins in isolation or people doing lovely things in isolation. Um, and I was having a look um, just before scrolling through my kind of social media feeds um, and there's amazing acts of kindness happening kind of all over Australia. Um, at the Centrelink in Townsville, as you can imagine, poor Centrelink staff right now are completely run off their feet. And so what their community did is overnight came in and just with chalk wrote this beautiful thank you mirage on the cement. So when the staff came in the next day, they had this beautiful thank you gratitude moment for all the work that they're kind of putting in right now. Um, I've heard a beautiful examples of people paying for the next 10 coffees um, for people who might be suffering a bit of hardship right now, but still want to be supporting their local businesses by paying, by buying a takeaway coffee um, but maybe not being able to afford it and someone kind of paying for the next 10. Um, there's a, a, a community group that got given um, I think uh, 207 kilograms of donated food that they could give to families that can't actually feed themselves right now because they've just but both parents or a single parent even has, um, has has lost all their income. So this stuff's happening all over Australia and, and on a more global um, level just this morning Virgin Australia who have lost 
billion, not Virgin Australia, Virgin Airlines, who have lost billions of dollars, have still invested in some R&D and they've actually produced what they're calling, let me get this right because I'm going to get it wrong, um, some form of, it's called a new bridge ventilator, which can basically be produced en masse. So one of the challenges with COVID is that if you end up getting really, really severe symptoms, you need to be ventilated and we've got limited ventilation um, facilities. And so this is actually a portable one that can actually uh, be used through this time. So um, individuals are doing cool things, organisations are doing cool things. That's just the, what I have time to list right now. And I'm sure the participants have got amazing examples of things yeah. that they've been able to achieve. Yeah, one of our, yeah. sorry, Claire, can I just bump in quickly? Yeah. One of our camp alumni shared on the weekend that she convinced her university to use their 3D printers to print ventilators for their hospital in WA. Um, and she's like, well, you know, we're not using them for anything right now. No one's attending class. And so, yeah, Paul has uh, made that change in the last week, which is really, really awesome. So, yeah, and redone. Bundaberg Rum have donated ethanol to be used as alternatives for hand sanitizers. <laughs> <laughs> Sounding great. Where do I line up? <laughs> Multipurpose. Um, well, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm thinking exactly the same. There's, I think this is the moment where, you know, we've always looked on at famous people doing wonderful things. I think this is the moment to really just get famous in our own pants, in our own communities. Why wouldn't we? There's, you know, in my community out here, people are putting bears and whatever in their windows so children can walk around and go on a bear hunt. You know, that brightens a little person's day. There's, my parents went for a walk yesterday in their local neighbourhood and someone with adequate social distancing followed them and said, is there anything you need? Shall I pop out and get you some milk? Do you need toilet paper? Uh, because they're older people. I mean, how wonderful that we don't, we don't actually have to look out there for stories of people doing wonderful things. They're right here in our communities. And I think that's something that we can all challenge ourselves to do amidst this, you know, feeling good and feeling motivated is doing doing stuff for other people. What, what act of service can you do without even leaving your home? There is so much that we can do. And this is going to be one of the greatest changes in humanity. This, this is a moment you're living that... Kids are going to be reading about you historically for the rest of time. How amazing you're living that moment now. Make it matter. Make it matter. We've peeled back all the stuff that doesn't matter. We peel back ridiculous ATAR exams that they don't define you anyway. They don't. They, they don't say whether you're a good human or a bad human or capable of, of going on to great things. We've peeled that stuff back now. And now we can cut through and just be great humans, each and every one of us right here in our space. Um, so, you know, if, if you can't find the motivation to get your schoolwork done, find that motivation to be uh, just a fabulous person. Go out there and draw that beautiful rainbow. I'm just watching someone put a comment up now. In chalk on your driveway, make a little person happy. Make a hopscotch on your road. How amazing. We have an awesome opportunity to do great good. Yeah, and um, to those working in corporates as well, it's a, it's a really beautiful opportunity to look at, I mean, just like Zero to Hero are doing, we're you know, chatting internally at the moment about what can we provide or how can we better provide um, support for young people and schools during this because um, they don't have the luxury of having a school psychologist and a student services centre right now. So how can we better support students and, and schools during this time in a digital way, which has never been something we've done. We've always um, always encouraged young people to get off the internet and off technology. Um, but, you know, it's forcing us as an organisation to adapt as well. Um, so, yeah, I am looking forward to seeing in a couple of years' time what isolation, uh, you know, enterprises have changed the way that we do business. I mean, I, I read the other day that Uber and, and WhatsApp were both created during the GFC. Um, so who knows? We could be right now on the, uh, on the preface of what's going to change the way we, we operate um, with bears in our windows. Um, so we are coming towards the end of, of the webinar. So I, I just get both of you to, um, before we throw out to some questions um, from our audience, succinctly, step by step, um, how do we improve our motivation level? So really, you know, really easy, easy to follow. What are some steps we can take or some simple tools and techniques um, that our, our listeners and people watching uh, can, can put into place tomorrow or tonight or right now um, to improve their motivation levels? 
Yeah, for sure. So I think um, step one would be around setting yourself some form of small 1% goal or one thing, whether it is getting out of your pyjamas by a certain time each day, but set yourself small milestones. And once you're kind of feeling a little bit better about your, where you're at in your headspace, it's about establishing a routine and doing your best to stick to it and actually rewarding yourself when you do. So I've set myself a working from home schedule, but when I actually look at my day, I'm actually only being productive or working for like four to five hours of, of that eight hour normal day and in there I've got like a well-being hour I do some yoga I go for a walk um, I've got certain goals that I do each day in terms of um, three entries in my gratitude journal um, random acts of kindness I have to do one nice thing for someone anonymously and they can't know that it's kind of come from me um, supporting a local business is another goal that I've set for myself to do each day. And what these things are is they're like little dopamine moments in your day to kind of keep you focused and keep you motivated through the course of your day. So, you know, ask yourself, what do you want to achieve out of this period? And then set yourself some realistic goals, depending on where your headspace is right now. Um, and in that kind of inject these little dopamine moments. That would be my advice. Yeah, beautiful. Oh, you're a lovely human doing those things, Anna. Look, I'm, I'm going to agree. I think, you know, we've all been told to kind of plan big for our life. Well, I, I reckon we'd pair it all back and plan small. Plan plan small. Just, just you know, do something small and, and feel really good about yourself. There's no one there to pat you on the back. Do it yourself. Um, get yourself an accountability partner. We're well connected online. Go and find someone who can say you can, you can check in with. And there's lots of apps that do this as well. So go and find someone and say, look, these are the things that I need to achieve today or this week. And then check in with each other. It, it really works. From someone who should not admit this went to Weight Watchers. I'll just put it out there. Um, you know, one of the biggest success factors is that you have an accountability partner that, you know, if you pretend that you've lost a kilo, but actually you've put on three, uh, there's someone there to go titch, titch, find that person. Um, probably not at Weight Watchers, but just in your local community. There's lots of people that will help you to stay on track. Um, and I, I just think you've just got to accept that we're going to do business differently now. That's, that's the way life is. And and there's a certain beauty and simplicity in that and, and be all right with that. Yeah, beautiful. Um, so before I uh, get you both to finish with your last piece of advice, um, I'm just going to throw you to some questions from the audience. So uh, Tessa, so she tends to notice that whenever she's at home uh, doing productive uni work, um, she feels guilty. Um, that means that I hardly have any time for myself so that... Um, such as watching Netflix, et cetera. I feel like I could be doing more uni work. Is there anything around guilt? So not doing productive uni work. I yeah, I, I that, that very well. <laughs> no, I, 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 I know what she means. Um, I think it was your poor reading skills, actually, Ash. There you go. Um, there I know you what go. you mean. Hey. So <laughs> I think a big part of this is being realistic around expectations. So when you're at school or when you're at work, there's actually heaps of non-productive time that you're actually still paid for or kind of like on the clock whether they be water cooler conversations, um, mucking around with your mates, kind of having a coffee and things like that. And then we get home and we're, we're working from home and we think that we have to be productive between eight and five. The brain's not actually designed to be productive for that. And so we need to actually be realistic about what we can actually achieve. So rather than scheduling yourself, you know, eight hours of uni work per day, just schedule yourself four. And then maybe when the uncertainty starts to ease and we can kind of start seeing a light at the tunnel and you're feeling a little bit less stressed, maybe you can scale up half an hour and then maybe you scale it up another half an hour. But be realistic about what you can actually achieve right now and give yourself a break. Feeling guilt is very counterproductive to feeling motivated. So I'd really challenge Tessa around her thoughts around it. You know, I'm being lazy, are you? Or are you just being realistic about what's achievable for me right now? Yeah, beautiful. And also then giving yourself opportunity to, when you need a break, take that break, whether it's call a friend, um, you know, the water cooler conversation or what would be yeah. recess at the MT at school. And, so and frame those work. things up as an investment rather than you being lazy. They're an investment in your well-being, which help you to be more productive. You're not cutting corners. You're not wasting time. You're investing in your well-being. Yeah, beautiful. Can I, can I just add on that as well? Yeah. I think 
you know I think I always I always take emotions to be my little personal messages so sometimes my I, I, I decide I'm going to ignore those messages but guilt is one of those things it's a bit like anxiety people talk about anxiety like it's terrible overwhelming anxiety yeah it is but actually when you're feeling anxious you tend to meet deadlines better um, and I, if, if I had to choose I'd much rather have an anxious surgeon than that one, one, one that was like, oh yeah, whatever, we'll sew this to that, she'll be right. So, you know, I think guilt has a place as well. I think you've just got to sit with that guilt and say, what is it trying to tell me? What is the message from this guilt? Do I need to find better balance? Do I need to do a little bit more? Do I need to work more productively? Try and understand what the message is because it takes away from just the clunking feeling on your chest. And you'll, you'll if you sit with it, you'll hear what the message is. It, it's there for a purpose. Yeah, beautiful. And um, and I will, we have touched on year 12s a little bit, but we've got a question from Ella. Um, we know it's difficult for year 12s. We know that we're not sure what's going to happen with ATAR um, at the moment. NAPLAN, NAPLAN's cancelled those so the other year groups can celebrate. Um, but what is a piece of advice that we could give to year 12s around how they could make the most of these times? Yeah, so from my point of view, my advice is probably um, applicable not just to year 12, but I, I suppose it's um, focusing on acceptance. So I grew up around the Alcoholic Anonymous Fellowship, and for anyone that's familiar with that fellowship, there's a serenity prayer that is a very common in that. Um, and you may be familiar with it. It goes like this. Um, Grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. And I think that's really important for our year 12s right now, is just acknowledging that there's a lot of stuff that you do not know, and it is uncertain, and it is unfair, but what can you do? What can you focus on? Rather than dwelling and brooding on the stuff that you've lost, it's about doing your very best to be opportunistic with this time that you have. If we keep doing what WA is doing right now, which is just being epic humans and doing as we're told, go Australia, this may not be as long as we think it is, which means you might very well be at school sooner. And if you've used this time to be productive, you know, you, you, you will come out the other side of this maybe better than you would have if you're stuck at school and having to sit through all those boring assemblies all the time, wasting time. And it is also beautiful preparation for uni and work life when you do have to govern your day and you do have to um, get assignments in on, you know, you don't have teachers breathing down your neck. Um, so it is perfect prep for what's after year 12. Um, and we do have a question from a parent. So I might give that one to you, Claire. Um, mm -hmm. What does a parent say to their year 12 student right now or to, start, to, to a young person that's struggling with um, all of the changes and the uncertainty um, from a school environment? Mm. You know, there's... There's so much incredible power in just listening. I don't know that we have to say things. We, you can't make this better. It's, it's, you know, it's an actual grief. This is a loss. They've watched other year groups for 11 or 12 years above them graduate and, and have muck up days and, and get to wear their, um, you know, their leavers tops and their leavers jackets and they're missing out. And that's just the reality. So I think just become a really deep reflective listener with your with your year 12. That's what I'm doing. I just reflect back what he's saying, Mum, it's so disappointing. And I go, it is disappointing. Mom. It's really disappointing. But I also make sure that I try and interrupt the pattern of that. I don't let him sit and wallow in it. Um, we do things that make him feel better. So we talk about... Um, being grateful. We talk about um, self-care and what he can be doing. We talk about adding him into um, big conversations that are happening. So lots of kids are setting themselves up online in study groups and, and chat groups. So I think we just reflectively listen to our children. I don't think we have to tell them that it's not disappointing. It is. It's actually really disappointing. Um, and, and saying to your child, just like all things in life, this too will pass. And in 10 years from now, you'll be telling it as a different story. Um, and, and while that's not helpful now, you will get through this, just like you've got through not getting invited to the birthday party that you really wanted to in year two. This is a disappointment and, and you're handling it as best you can. And I, I think that's, that's all we can do with our year 12s is really be there for them. I don't think comments like I've heard people say, well, you know, there's some children who don't get to get to year 12 and get a chance at tertiary education. So it's kind of not useful putting it into that perspective or say there's children who are dying today, aren't you lucky to be home, studying from home? 
it's not useful either. Our kids don't have that perspective. We've got to be very deeply respectful that this is a time of deep grief and deep loss and accept that this is the way it is and then just put little things, raise that dopamine and, and keep them motivated and connected, the biggest thing, um, because that's what they're missing out on. So that would be my advice. But Ash, I really think out of all of this, watching those questions, a year 12 specific um, webinar would be a would be an excellent idea for our year 12s. Yeah, beautiful. And if you do have some ideas for um, some of our next webinars, we do have a webinar on Thursday around boosting the immune system, um, which our young, per you know, one of our young people did request. So if you've got some ideas of other webinars, then uh, please add those to the chat. And we'll um, do our best to to get experts for those subjects. Um, so Anna, I might leave um, with a, a last piece of advice for you. If there's anything you want to add before I close off. Yeah, I suppose in summary, from my point of view, um, just echoing Claire's comments around just permission to be sad, but knowing where the line is for where that sadness is becoming really counterproductive to you having a holistic, well and happy life. And so if you wake up one day and you're just feeling really low and lousy and sorry for yourself, that's okay. And just give yourself that time. Um, but it's about making sure that you're taking small achievable steps that are moving you in the direction that you can come out the other side of this being proud of yourself rather than looking back at it as the worst months of your life. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah, yeah. Um, I agree. Claire, was there anything I, you wanted to add? I, think, um, I, I would say for me, the most important thing for our young people watching is to stay connected to your friends. You might be isolated physically and not be able to give those lovely big hugs, but you're connected online and while most parents have been horrified about how often that little uh, device is in your hand and by that I mean your phone for our boys um, I, that, I know Tara sorry terrible joke mother of teenage boys there's things that go in hands that shouldn't be there that often sorry Ash <laughs> um, <laughs> I got the <you. laughs> But, I, you know, I think stay connected to your friends, set up chat rooms, make sure you get in there and, and stay connected to all your friends. It's really important. That's your driver right now. That's your most important thing. Schoolwork, you can catch up on that. Stay connected to your friends. Stay connected to your social life and, and, and do it every day, every day. Yeah, beautiful. Um, and so that concludes uh, the end of our first webinar. So thank you to Anna and Claire for um, being very generous heroes and, and being here for us today. Um, thank you for imparting all of your expert knowledge and um, all of your uh, advice to the 72 people that joined us today and the, the many more that will watch the recording of this after. Um, and I just want to close with if you yourself are struggling or if um, you need support, then there are um, a lot of organisations that are out there to help you. Zero to Hero is one of them. We also have Kids Helpline, uh, 1800 55 1800, um, or Lifeline, 13 11 14. Um, and, you know, one of the silver linings of what we're currently going through is that the Australian government have highlighted mental health as a, a massive area of concern during COVID. And so they're literally piling billions of dollars into um, the sector. We're not getting any of it for those that were, were sitting there um, secretly hoping, like uh, like some of the Zero to Hero team. Um, but Beyond Blue have been given some uh, a, a large amount of funding and so has Headspace to develop online portals um, and also information for young people to engage with uh, and uh, Headspace will include some parenting and, and teaching information and then also reachout.com have some really great resources and some information and some advice um, to help you get through this period of time um, and if you need some some local specific or, or um, you know, if you're in a particular regional town and you want to know some of the resources there, then uh, please just drop us an email. So you can do that through our website, zerotohero.com.au or just send us an email. So if you send it to admin at zero number two hero.com.au, uh, we'd love to give you a full list of resources. Um, and fortunately as well, you can get the help you need from isolation right now. So there are GPs and, and organisations that are doing, um, you know, virtual virtual um, consults at the moment and um, and so are psychologists and counsellors and Claire is, is also a therapist and Anna that works in the, in the organisational um, side of psych. Uh, so yeah, there's two amazing women on the phone right now or on the uh, 
Webb and I right now that are there to help. Um, if you want some geo-specific locations and resources, please get in touch. Um, otherwise, there's your Kids Helpline, Lifeline, um, reachout.com, uh, Beyond Blue and Headspace, which have some really great tools uh, and are there to support our young people and, and parents as well. Um, so please don't suffer in silence. Please get the help that you need and the support that you need and we um, would love to, to support you in getting that if you don't feel like you're ready to. Um, Thank you to the, the 72 people that joined us today. Thank you to Anna and Claire. Um, I hope that tomorrow you can get out of your pajamas uh, a little bit earlier and, and go for that work or walk or, or start exercising. Um, and also to you know get the, the motivation to, to get through your task list tomorrow. Thank you very much. And uh, hopefully we'll see you at our next webinar. See you later. Thanks for having us. Thanks guys. Enjoy your night. Bye.